Hello Saints. I recently watched Brian Denlinger's satanic video entitled Official Catholic Teaching on the Trinity for Myself after watching Brother Ed Fenninger's video entitled Brian Denlinger Defends His Heresy. Since I was planning to do a video teaching on the Trinity or the Godhead, I wanted to hear what that messed up heretic had to say. I can tell you that as I was watching that satanic video, I was seething in anger at his total stupidity and his lies that, believe me, I really wanted to knock that guy's teeth out. He is totally brain dead. The really disturbing thing for me is the fact that Denlinger and his wife defended their heresy like it is no big deal as they're laughing and giddying and having a good time. And to top it off, Denlinger had the audacity to call anyone who disagree with him Roman Catholics who were somehow plotting a conspiracy against him. First of all, for Brian Denlinger, Denlinger to call anyone who disagree with them Roman Catholics is totally cultish. Here's why. It's simply because he's setting himself up to be the standard and not the King James Bible that he supposedly believes. Cult leaders are never gracious and throw a temper tantrum to anyone who questions or criticizes them simply because they themselves can't stand up to criticism. And so they launch a verbal tirade against them. That's what I saw when Denlinger attacked myself, Brother Ed, and Steven Anderson for taking a biblical stand on the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity and calling Denlinger out for his damnable heresy known as modalism. And speaking of taking a biblical stand, I want to make it crystal clear to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that I am not a Roman Catholic, nor have I ever been one, and I am certainly not a closet Catholic. I am a King James Bible-believing Christian, a follower and disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am saved simply because I believed the gospel. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, and I believe with my heart, with every fire of my being, I'm totally, as a, as a King James Bible would call it, fully persuaded, or you want to call it, I'm, I was, I'm totally convinced that Jesus Christ died on that cross for me to pay the death penalty for my sins, and he rose again from the dead three days later. And I put my faith in him and him alone for salvation. I believe that the King James Bible, have it right here, is the perfect and preserved word of God in the English language and it is the only authority in all matters of faith and practice. I believe everything what this precious book says, not only because God said it, but, also, but I've also seen how true it is in my own life on a daily basis. I strongly and deeply believe that what I teach from the King James Bible, and by God's grace and power, I am totally committed to teaching sound biblical truth to edify my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, whether they are very seasoned or babes in Christ. And this leads to my last important point that will lead into this very important study. The doctrine of the Trinity or the Godhead is a very crucial, foundational, and fundamental Bible doctrine. And I want to emphasize the last two words that I said just now. Bible doctrine. It is not a Roman Catholic doctrine and never has been. Brian Denlinger clearly is a total liar, deceiver, heretic, a false teacher and an antichrist and as you keep watching this video you'll see why I say he is an antichrist so please keep watching I am not saying it out of slander and it's certainly not a false accusations I don't make videos to slander people or make any false accusations or spread lies God forbid I make videos to teach the truth and what I just said about Brian Dillinger is 100% true. 
hardcore truth. I see it, and so does every discerning Bible believer in Christ, with the exception of Denlinger himself and his blind, deceived subscribers. The message I got from his satanic video, it's certainly not of the Lord, is that what we know of the Trinity, according to Brian Denlinger, is based on the Roman Catholic Catechism. That's why he had his wife read it. Not only is it why he calls those who disagree with him Roman Catholics, but it also supports his notion that we can't really understand the Trinity because it is a mystery and that he wants us to accept this heresy known as modalism by faith that Jesus is God the Father. <laughs> If you have your King James Bible, please look up with me Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. And before I go on, as I often said in my other videos, please be a Berean. Don't take everything I say hook, line, and sinker. This King James Bible is your final, I, sh I should say it's your only authority, and I'm a man under this authority. Please check everything I say in light of this precious book and see if what I'm saying lines up with it. Please follow the example of the Bereans, my fellow saints. And in this study, we'll be going through a lot of scripture. So please follow along with me in your King James Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29 says, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. In terms of how the Godhead or the Trinity operates, it is a mystery that our finite minds can't comprehend. We really can't comprehend how Jesus can be both God and man at the same time. It's, it's far beyond our finite minds. I qualify that as the secret things that belong unto the Lord our God. However, all that we know about the Trinity, the Godhead, is written in the King James Bible. They are those things which are revealed, that belong unto us and to our children forever. In light of that, we see again, Brian Denlinger is a total liar and deceiver. Folks, God has written all we need to know about him so that we can know him personally. To know him is to love him. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God expressed his desire for his people to know him. Jeremiah chapter 9 and verses 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, neither let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exerciseth loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. A lawyer asked the Lord Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And here's our Lord's response. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37, 38. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Our Lord commands us to love God with all our mind, as well as our heart and soul. There must be an understanding in our love for God, and one way we can love God with our mind is to understand the Godhead or the Trinity, as it is revealed to us in the King James Bible. I agree 100% what the Roman Catholic Catechism says about the Godhead, or Trinity, not because I am Roman Catholic. It's simply because it is based on what the King James Bible teaches about the Godhead. Now before we really get into this very important study, it is important to note that the word Trinity is not found in the King James Bible. However, the word Godhead is, and it is mentioned only twice in the King James Bible, and they're both in the New Testament, and they're both in the Pauline epistles. Here's the first mention of the word Godhead. 
Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The second mention of the word Godhead is in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. For in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Let me share something with you, my fellow saints, uh, something very interesting. That verse in Colossians 2 verse 9 came into my mind and I was thinking that this is the verse Denlinger must have used to support his idiotic rubbish about Jesus being the body, the Father being the soul, and the Holy Spirit being the spirit. And sure enough, as I watched that video, the official Catholic teaching on the Trinity, Brian Denlinger used that particular verse. <laughs> Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines the word Godhead this way. Number one, Godship, Deity, Divinity, Divine Nature or Essence, applied to the true God and to heathen deities. Number two, a deity in person. Mm, interesting. A god or goddess. What was Paul saying in Colossians 2 verse 9? It's really simple, folks. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. The apostle, or as Webster put it, he's deity in person. The Apostle John said in John chapter 1 and verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was, manifest, was manifested in the flesh. In his humanity, our Lord had a body, soul, and spirit, and yet he was and still is God. There's absolutely no, zero scriptural reference to support Denlinger's idiotic notion of, of Jesus being the body, the Father being the soul, and the Holy Spirit being the spirit. Denlinger claims he believes the King James Bible and accept what it says, and yet he clearly rejects this crucial, fundamental Bible doctrine of one God in three persons. Jesus had the Father and the Holy Spirit in him. All three persons of the Godhead are one in essence, and in the person of Jesus Christ, they are manifested. That's what Paul was saying, proving once again that Brian Dengler clearly is a, is a lying heretic. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines the word Trinity this way. In theology, the union of three persons in one Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen to that. And yet Brian Denlinger in his video basically said that we, get, that we got our doctrine of the Trinity from the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. As already mentioned, it is not a Roman Catholic doctrine. It is a very crucial, foundational, fundamental Bible doctrine. And now we can begin our study by looking at the one verse that clearly presents the strongest statement of the Godhead. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The Lord Jesus affirmed uh, the Godhead in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The King James Bible clearly teaches the oneness of God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. However, the King James Bible also teaches that this one true living God is also a triune God who exists as three distinct, not separate persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
This is what we see in 1 John 5, verse 7, and Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. The Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church got it right when it says that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three divine persons. And yet Brian Denlinger couldn't understand simple English when he said three separate bodies. Man, oh man. Eww. We can't separate the three persons of the Godhead, nor can we isolate them or divide them. They are one. They are distinct in terms of their functionality. And yet they are co-equal and co-eternal. And this leads to another very important point. As followers of Christ, we don't worship three gods. One of the main reasons Muslims reject Christianity is the false notion that we are idolaters who worship three gods. Brian Denlinger is in agreement with the Muslims when we say God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is found in the King James Bible. But the, but the exact words, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, are not. Does that mean that the King James Bible doesn't teach that? Absolutely not. Brian Denlinger clearly is a heretic because he completely rejects the Bible doctrine of one God in three persons by saying that, again, the Father being the the soul, Jesus being the body, and the Holy Spirit being the, being the, being the spirit, and that there are three parts to the Godhead. No, 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 no. Sometimes the King James Bible doesn't have to use the exact words to teach an important doctrine. We say God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to convey the idea that each person of the Godhead are distinct and yet co-equal. All three persons are God, and they are one in essence. Denler can't get that because of his own cursed pride and unbelief. And yet he said he is a Bible believer. No, no he isn't. No, he isn't at all. I'm seeing more that he only believes the King James Bible if it fits his way of thinking instead of the other way around. To better understand how crucial this Bible doctrine it is very important that we take a look at each person of the Godhead and see what the King James Bible says. So please follow along with me in your King James Bible as we will now take a closer look at the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We begin with the first person of the Godhead, the Father. The King James Bible makes it crystal clear that the, that the Father is God. In the Old Testament, we see that God is the father of the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 6. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me. Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 16, Doubtless thou art our father, through Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledgest not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1, When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and called my son out of Egypt. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 16, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where is mine honor? And Malachi chapter 2 and verse 10, Have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? In the Gospels we see that our Lord called God his father. Matthew chapter 11 and verses 25 and 26. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, our Lord taught us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven. He also taught us that we are to come to the Father in his name. 
John chapter 16 and verse 23. Verily, I ver verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Our Lord also told his disciples that both he and the Father would soon send the Comforter. John chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. The Apostle Paul in his letters made it clear also that God is the Father and the Father is God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 2 and 3. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Galatians chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised them from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 23. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Titus chapter 1 and verse 4. To Titus, mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. God is the Father, and the Father is God. King James Bible make it so clear as crystal. It is also important to understand that the Father alone is not the only true and most high God. Equally important is to understand that Jesus Christ is not God the Father. Notice that in the five passages that we've read in the Pauline epistles, every time Paul mentioned God the Father, Jesus Christ is also mentioned. Why is that? I believe the reason is twofold. Number one, I believe that Paul wanted to get across to his readers, as well as us today, is the fact that there is an inseparable union between the Father and the Son. We can never isolate them nor divide them. Any moment, we're going to see that our relationship with the Father depends on our relationship with the Lord Jesus. Number two, even though there is an inseparable union between the Father and the Son, as they are one in essence, they are not one and the same person. Every time Paul said God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, he was making a distinction between the two persons. When Jesus said in John chapter 14 verse 9, He that had seen me had seen the Father, he was clearly not saying that he is the Father. In verse 11 of the same chapter, our Lord said, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Our Lord clearly was saying that even though they are one in essence, he was making a distinction between himself and the Father. Our Lord was revealing the Father through his words and his deeds. Jesus Christ was the reflection of God the Father. That is the idea the Apostle Paul was getting at when he said in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 that Christ is the image of the invisible God. He also said in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 that Jesus is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Jesus Christ is not God the Father and God the Father is not Jesus Christ. God the Father is certainly not the soul as Brian Denlinger, the heretic, stupidly teaches and defends. There's absolutely nowhere in the King James Bible does it say that. And if he tells you that it does, like he did in the video, he's lying to you big time. We've now come to the second member of the Godhead, God the Son. In the 18th minute mark of his satanic video, Official Catholic Teaching on the Trinity, 
Denlinger critiqued my video, which I made entitled Jesus Christ is not God the Father. And Denlinger said that nowhere in the King James Bible do you find the exact words God the Son and that we have two different gods. Man, oh man. He also critiqued and personally attacked Brother Ed Fenninger. Love you, brother. And his video entitled, Brian Denlinger Denies That Jesus Is God The Son. Denlinger openly admitted it. The reason? He said that the King James Bible doesn't teach that. Do you see why he, he, he gets so much flack and so much heat from many of the brethren? And why many brethren like Brother Ed and myself right now are, are up in arms about this whole thing? It's incredible. Denlinger's heretical statement reminds me of another major reason why Muslims reject Christianity. It's the notion that Jesus Christ is God. I've watched a video a few months ago where a brother talked about how Muslims have been trained to ask the question, where in the Bible does Jesus say, I am God, worship me? In other words, Muslims, out of their unbelief, use the exact words criterion to not only trip us as believers in Christ, but also to deceive us. Brian Denlinger is doing the exact same thing with the exact words criterion out of his unbelief and rejection of the crucial, fundamental, foundational Bible doctrine that Jesus is God the Son and that there is a clear distinction between Him and the Father. It's true that you won't find the exact words, God the Son, in the King James Bible. However, if, you're, if Denler is going to use the exact words criterion to reject the idea that Jesus is God the Son, he might as well do the same with the concept of the rapture. The word rapture itself does not appear in the King James Bible. Does that mean that it doesn't teach it? How about the words, faith alone? Oh, you're going to hear Daniel going up in arms and passionately defend as if, it, as if his life depends on and saying, you won't find faith alone in the Bible. That's true. You won't find the exact words faith alone in the King James Bible. But does that mean that the Bible doesn't teach that? How about the word Bible? You won't find it in the King James Bible. Does that mean that the King James Bible doesn't teach that it is the word of God? Romans chapter 16 and verses 17 and 18 says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and, watch this, by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. By good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Brian Denlinger clearly is deceiving the hearts of the simple with his good words and fair speeches. By using the exact words criterion in rejecting the truth that Jesus Christ is God the Son. As already mentioned, the King James Bible sometimes doesn't use the exact words to teach an important doctrine. Just because the words God the Son doesn't appear in the King James Bible doesn't mean that it doesn't teach that. And as we look into the scriptures, we will see once again that Brian Dillinger is clearly, totally a lying heretic who is so ignorant. And by the way, my next video, God Wound, will be about the, the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of the Living God. I can't wait to get into that and share with you, my, my fellow saints. And because, I'll, and because I will be doing a, a topic, a video on that very topic, I won't go too much into what I have to say be, for the sake of time. Once again, Brian Denlinger clearly doesn't get the fact that there is distinction between the Father and the Son, two persons in the Godhead. And they are and they and yet they are one. In fact, our Lord said in John chapter 10 and verse 30, I and my Father are one. 
John chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Very interesting. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, the apostle John called Jesus the second member of the Godhead, the Word. In his gospel, John, John, called the, also, John called our Lord the Word that really set the tone for the remainder of it. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 13. This talks, clearly talks about the second coming of our Lord and what will, and what will happen. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes was a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Clearly, the Apostle John wants us to understand that Jesus Christ is the living Word of God, who is God Almighty from all eternity. Not only that, he wanted us to understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, or God the Son. In fact, near the end of his Gospel, the Apostle John explained his purpose in writing it. John chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31. This is the key verse of John's gospel. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have, ye might have life in his name. 1 John chapter 5 verses 10 to 13. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not, God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written. Right here, folks, this is the record. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that ye have eternal life, and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. Second John, Second John verse 3. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. Notice in the third verse of 2 John that the Apostle John did exactly what the Apostle Paul did in his letters. We see both God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, which showed the inseparable union between the two persons of the Godhead. Like Paul, John also made a distinction between the two when he called the Lord Jesus the Son of the Father. It's very clear, folks, that they are not one and the same person. Jesus Christ is God, and He is also God's Son. In fact, He is the only begotten Son. And because He is the, and because he is the only begotten Son, he is, he is God, as He is equal with God the Father. It makes sense why he said, I and my Father are one. The King James Bible makes it clear that the second person of the Godhead stepped out of eternity and became flesh for the sole purpose to save us from our sins. He made salvation possible at the cross of Calvary where he shed his precious blood and died a horrible death. But that didn't end there. Three days later, the Son of God rose bodily and triumphantly from the dead, proving that His sacrifice satisfied the justice and wrath 
of Almighty God. It was out of love for you and me that Jesus was sent by the Father so that we can become his children and have a relationship with him. John chapter 3 and verses 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, he, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the, of the only begotten Son of God. Romans chapter 5 and verses 8 and 10. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I always love 1 John chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10. It's amazing. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 14 of 1 John chapter 4. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Because sin came into this world through Adam and Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden, it created a huge gap between a thrice holy God and sinful humanity. Through the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ bridged the gap, bridged that gap, making it possible for us to be reconciled with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 5 and 6, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The moment we believe the gospel and put our trust in Christ for salvation, we have a right standing with God as our position is in Christ and Christ is in us. This is why we need to take seriously these important words of our Savior, recorded in John chapter 15 and verses 4 and 5. John chapter 15 verses 4 and 5, our Lord said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Not only are we in Christ, but we are also in the Father, and the Father is in us. We cannot separate the two as they are one in essence. To be in Christ is to be in the Father also. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. John chapter 14, verses 21 and 23. Our Lord speaking. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Verse 23, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Clearly, this is talking about fellowship. Because of our faith in Christ and his blood atonement, not only do we have fellowship with him, but with, but with the father also. We are loved by the Father because we love His only begotten Son. 
This fellowship that we now have is eternal and it will never end. Romans chapter 8 and verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen to that. Because we belong to Jesus Christ, who redeemed us with his blood, we must follow him. Since he is our Lord, as well as our example, and live in humble dependence upon him and for the glory of God. Please look up with me Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 to 11. Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 to 11. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen and amen. The King James Bible doesn't so. King James Bible doesn't teach that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or God the Son just because the exact words God the Son doesn't appear in it. That's what Brian Denlinger said in his video. He's basically denying this crucial Bible truth that Jesus Christ is God and he is also God's Son. Therefore, that qualifies that lying, messed up, brain dead heretic as an antichrist. I didn't say that. This King James Bible said it. First John chapter 2 and verses 22 and 23. Who is a liar but he that denied that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Once again, Jesus Christ is not, absolutely not, God the Father. He is God the Son. By that I am acknowledging that one, the Son himself is God, and two, he is distinct from the Father. Therefore, there cannot be two gods, as Brian Denlinger stupidly, stupidly asserted in his video. Unbelievable. Absolute balderdash. Two gods, all oh, because you say God the Father and God the Son. Total balderdash, man. Because of the inseparable union between the two distinct persons of the Godhead, to acknowledge the Son is to acknowledge the Father. And for Denlinger to openly deny the Son by saying he is the Father is to deny the Father himself. In that video, Brian Denlinger and his wife were all giddy. Hey, yeah, and we're all smiles in that video, having a good time, not a care in the world. They won't be smiling when they stand before the judgment, they, when they stand at the judgment seat of Christ who is God the Son, an answer for their lies, deceptions, and heresies one day. I can guarantee you that. One moment, please. Oh, excuse me. So far, we've seen that the Father is God and the Son is God. Now we come to the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Obviously, 
you won't find the exact words God the Holy Ghost in the Kingdom's Bible. When we say God the Holy Spirit, we're acknowledging the fact that the Holy Spirit himself is God and he is distinct from the Father and the Son even though he is co-equal and co-eternal with them. He is not a force or energy as some cults erroneously teach. He is a divine person. The Son of God made that clear when he spoke these words to his disciples. John chapter 14 and verses 16 and 17. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. John chapter, or we already read that, John chapter 15 verse 26. So we'll, we'll go on and read John chapter 16 and verses 7 to 15. Please look up, look up with me in that passage. John chapter 16 and verses 7 through 15. King James Bible says this, Nevertheless, Jesus speaking, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, uh, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. The Apostle Peter, in his confrontation with Ananias, you know the story of Ananias and Sapphira, Peter made the, made Peter in his confrontation with Ananias also made it clear that the Holy Spirit is not only a person, a divine person, but he also acknowledges his deity. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. The Holy Spirit, without question, is God. The Apostle Paul in his letters also teaches that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. Romans chapter 15 verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The moment we believe the gospel and put our faith in Christ for salvation, the Holy Spirit takes up permanent residence in our lives as we become members of the body of Christ, the church, and we become his temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have received of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. <clears throat> Excuse me. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. The moment we believe the gospel and put our faith in Christ for salvation, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. As already mentioned, to be in Christ is to be in the Father also. Now let's go a step further with this. 
because we are in Christ, we're not only in the Father also, but we are in the Holy Spirit as well, and the Spirit dwells in us. There's no way we can live the Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit. This is why Paul, in his letters, commanded us to live, walk, and move in the Spirit. Please look up with me Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I love how somebody said that the Paul's epistles to Romans are like the Himalayas of the Bible. And Romans chapter 8 is Mount Everest. Love it. Absolutely love it. We're going to read the first set we're going to read the first 17 verses of Romans chapter 8 because they're they're very self-explanatory. Romans chapter 8 verses 1 to 17. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Let me stop right there. Let's read Rome, let's read, excuse me, Galatians chapter 5 and verses 16 and 17 and verse 25. Galatians chapter 5 and verses 16 and 17. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need Him to live for Christ on a daily basis. Paul made it clear in Galatians 5 verses 16 and 17 that we cannot do whatever we want because the Spirit of God and the flesh are at war. And every day we must choose whom are we going to yield to. This is why Denlinger's notion that an automatic or basically a change, this is why the Denlinger's notion that a changed life is automatic um, after salvation is both Calvinistic and ridiculous. I made a video about sanctification. The moment you believe the gospel and put your trust in Christ, you're changed instantly. You're sanctified instantly. However, in the process of the second stage, the second thing about sanctification is the, I forget what you call it, um, the graduate process. The whole point is that it's not automatic because it, ex it, it God, in other words, when you think about it, um, God does all the work, 
and it absolves the Christian of his responsibility. Um, sounds like sinless perfection to me, folks. We have, folks, we had, we, have, we had free will before salvation, and we still have free will after it. And this is important that we, every one of us need to understand and not believe this notion that, you know, a changed life is automatic after salvation. A changed life only occurs if we voluntarily choose to walk, excuse me, let me get the papers in order. A changed life only occurs if we voluntarily choose to yield to the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. How do we do that? By spending time in fellowship with our Lord through personal Bible study and daily communication with Him in prayer and living for Him. This is what our Lord talked about, abiding in Him and He abiding in us. I mean, He will abide in us, but we have to do our part too, abide in Him. When we choose to yield to the Spirit and walk in the Spirit on a daily basis, we will manifest the fruit of the Spirit and our lives will change. Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, long, long, excuse me, let me begin again. I'm sorry about that. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory as by the spirit of the Lord. My fellow saints, do you now see the eternal, inseparable link between the three persons of the Godhead? The Father made our relationship with Him dependent on our relationship with the Son. And the Son made our relationship with Him dependent on our relationship with the Holy Spirit. For Brian Denlinger to say there are three separate bodies or three parts to the Godhead is not only incorrect, but totally stupid, as it only reveals his ignorance. You cannot divide or isolate the three distinct, not separate persons of the Godhead as they are one. And because of our faith in Christ and his blood atonement, we are in union with the blessed Godhead forever. Before I conclude this video, it is very important for us to understand that when we refer to the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit as first, second, and third person of the Godhead, it has absolutely nothing to do with rank as one person is above another. All three persons of the Godhead are co-equal and co-eternal and have perfect love for each other and unity between them. One person never acts independently of the others or in opposition to them. Here's where the distinction between the three persons of the Godhead really come into play. Each person of the Godhead are one in essence, and yet they are distinct in terms of the particular role they have. The Father is referred to as the first person of the Godhead because of the fact that He is the originator. The Son is referred to as the second person because He is the agent. And the Holy Spirit is referred to as the third person because he is the applicator or the administrator. Here are two biblical examples to prove this fact. The first is the fact that all three persons were involved in creation. Please look up with me the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, and we'll be reading the first eight verses. Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 to 8. The Word of God says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. 
and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a ferment in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the ferment and divided the waters which were under the ferment and under the ferment from the waters which were above the ferment. And it was so. And God called the ferment heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. And as you read through the rest of chapter one, we see that the crown of creation is man. So God created male and female uh, in the image of God. He created, oh, I, better, I better read it so I will not misquote it. Um, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. The second verse tells us that the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary explained that the Spirit of God literally continued brooding over it as a fowl does when hatching eggs. The, the immediate agency of the Spirit by working on the dead and discordant elements combined, arranged, and ripened them into a state adapted for being the scene of a new creation. End of quote. So here we see the Holy Spirit's role as the administrator in creation. In the third verse, we clearly see the distinction between the Father and the Son. It was God the Father who said, let there be light. And it was God the Son who created the light. When we continue reading through the first chapter of Genesis, we see that creation originated in the Father and the Son was the agent in creation. It makes sense why the Apostle John called Jesus the Word who was God and in the beginning with God. The Apostle Paul said in Colossians chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17, Colossians chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17, for by, for by him, Jesus Christ, will all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. Revelation chapter four and verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. The second is the fact that all three persons were involved in salvation. The plan of salvation originated in the Father. The Son is the agent who executed that plan to perfection through his death on the cross for our sins and his bodily resurrection on the third day. And it is made real in our lives through the Holy Spirit. It is only in this sense that we speak of the first, second, and third persons of the Godhead. So, in conclusion, remember the Apostle Paul's warning in Romans chapter 16 that we, must, we are to mark and avoid those who, by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple? Brian Denlinger said that we can't really understand the Godhead because it is a mystery. And I think he said that God has laid a certain order and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And that is, and that, and, and here's, here's the thing that really kills me. He also said that it is, that it is prideful to say that we know about God and understand him. It is prideful to say that we know about God and understand him. And also, we, he basically said that we just have to accept by faith this modalist heresy that there are three parts to the Godhead and that Jesus is God the Father. Sounds good, doesn't it? Oh, it's prideful to say that we know about God understanding him or we just have to accept the fact that Jesus is God the Father. Sounds good, isn't it? It's fair, it is fair for him to say that, right? My, my fellow saints, 
Brian Denlinger is deceiving the hearts of many brethren. Exactly what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 16. When the disciples asked our Lord what will be the sign of his coming, the very first thing he said recorded in Matthew 24 verse 4 was this, take heed that no man deceive you. I hope and I pray you are seeing by now that Brian Denlinger is not only a lying, brain-dead heretic, but also an antichrist who is to be marked and avoided like the plague. And he goes on in that video saying, the oh, I stabbed him in the back. Well, you want to know why I quote-unquote stabbed him in the back, as he says? Because what he's saying, all that he said about Lordship Salvation, all he said about the doctrine of the Trinity, goes against the King James Bible. The scripture says, let God be true and every man a liar. And Brian Denley clearly is a liar. He's saying these things about the Trinity that goes against the word of God. And it's a no brainer which side I'm gonna be on. I'm on the Lord's side. No brainer folks. And here's another thing I wanna show you. This is Brian Denlinger's mathematics here. I just printed this out. Let me show this right here. Simple mathematics. This is the top part is, oh, if I can see that here. This is the top part here. This is Denlinger's view of the Trinity as three separate beings or three parts to the Godhead. One plus one plus one equals three. Now here's the bottom part, the King James Bible mathematics concerning the Godhead. One times one times one equals one. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I really like how Athanasius of Alexandria beautifully, beautifully put concerning the doctrine of the Godhead or Trinity in his creed. He said this and I quote, we worship one God in Trinity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And yet they are not three gods, but one God. Three and one, one and three, and the one in the middle died for me. It's so simple, folks, that a child can understand that. The writer of the hymn entitled, Come Thou Almighty King, expressed the Bible truth of the Godhead in the last stanza. It goes like this, to thee, great one and three, eternal praises be, hence evermore. Thy sovereign majesty may we in glory see and to eternity love and adore. I posted the video link in the description box so you can not only listen, but also read the words of that grand old hymn. I also posted another link so you can listen to another grand old hymn entitled, Holy, Holy, Holy. And I believe you'll be blessed as you listen to both of them. My brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, we really have the total package in the triune God. In this God, we have the Father, who out of his great love for us, he truly is, he truly is a father, he truly is our heavenly parent. Out of his great love for us, he sent his only begotten son to save us and redeem us from, from sin. In this God, we have the son, Jesus Christ, who is our brother, who shed his precious blood and not only died for us, but he also rose again three days later. And he is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. In this God, we have the Holy Spirit who is our 
comforter, and teacher as he leads us into all truth revealed in the scriptures and he empowers us to live as children of God and to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. This triune God loves us so much as he hears our prayers, understands our pain, watches over us and protects us, and he meets our needs. He is always available 24 seven for us to talk to and to enjoy sweet fellowship. Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. How wonderful and how comforting it is to know, love, and worship this great God in three persons, the blessed Godhead. Amen. Your comments are always welcome. I really enjoy getting feedback and I hope and pray that this very important study has been edifying to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I pray that God will use it however he sees fit. And uh, I'm sorry if it's a, a little bit too long, but it's a very crucial and, and a very huge topic that needs to be addressed and refute all the nonsense that Brian Dengler teaches in his videos. So once again, I hope you've been blessed. I hope and pray I didn't say anything on borderline heretical. Please let me know. And uh, if I said anything heretical, I'll gladly take this video down and God will do it again and get it right. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video in its entirety. May God bless you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I love you all so much. And until the next video in which we talk about Jesus being the Son of God, let me close with these words of benediction of the Apostle Paul taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.